Uh, next to me will be Mary Beth Long, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, uh, with a long history of working in, in the Middle East, uh, close ties to many of uh, or close relations and knowledge of many of, 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 of the Gulf countries, and just returned from Israel. So uh, lots of knowledge of what's going on there. Next to her, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to both Iraq and Turkey, uh, and uh, former Deputy National Security Advisor to, to George W. Bush. Uh, and finally, Denise Natalie, one of the foremost experts in D.C. Uh, on all things uh, Iraq, and, and especially also uh, the KRG. Uh, and we're very lucky to be moderated by uh, Arshad Mohammed, uh, the diplomatic correspondent here in D.C. for Reuters, uh, and very well versed in the, the halls of power in D.C., having formally reported from the State Department and the White House. So with that, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Blaze. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for being here. Um, as I read uh, your report over the weekend, um, I had three sort of thoughts about it. One was um, the enemy gets a vote. And so one of the things I would like to talk to the panelists about is how they think Iran is going to respond over the medium term. Um, a second thing that I was thinking about is that the American people get literally and figuratively a vote. and I'm particularly interested in what level of American involvement in the Middle East um, is sustainable and supportable by the American people. The report had a really interesting line in it where it said we have had two successive presidents who want to do less in the Middle East and spend less blood and, and treasure. Um, and then the final thing I, I'd like us to get to is, although the other panel discussed it, is you know, your allies, your adversaries, your partners all get a vote. And I'm interested in, in your take um, on how uh, not just the Europeans, but also Russia, China, et cetera, may look at, uh, at the world and US policy. So to start with, Mary Beth, if I may turn to you, since you're in the, in the, in the central seat, can you give us a sense of how you think Iran is going to behave in the medium term, having seen the U.S. government just abandon uh, an agreement with it? And in particular, do you see Iran as trying to uh, exact more of a price from the United States in any theater? This actually harkens back to um, a considerable amount of conversation um, in Israel this past week uh, during the time period in which there was the exchange of um, fire across the border, of course, between the Israelis and the Iranians. And I think, um, by and large, the consensus of the group, uh, while varying in opinions not unlike the conversation between Jake and Eric, was that at least in the short term, um, that everyone anticipated that Iran would double down um, tactically um, and at least try to put more pressure, particularly on Israel, um, as well as uh, using surrogates, Hezbollah in particular, in Lebanon um, and Gaza uh, to put additional pressure on Israel again, but the United States through Israel that one of the things that Iran would very likely do, and I think we'll see this playing out, or maybe we already do, is um, have it really both ways. On the one hand, uh, play the victim, extract from the Europeans all the sympathy that they could possibly get, um, every concession in order not to abandon the agreement, uh, which leaves the European in a very difficult place of appeasing the Iranians so that they don't overtly abandon the agreement, while being pressured by the U.S., of course, uh, through our sanctions. So putting a real wedge um, between the U.S. and um, our European allies uh, and the transatlantic partnership, while at the same time being able to excuse a lot of its behavior on the ground because the U.S. did walk away um, from the relationship. Uh, what was unclear was, frankly, while Iran uh, probably continues to test Israel, particularly the defense forces, uh, while Iran uses Hezbollah increasingly, while um, Iran continues to probe on the Golan Heights. The question is what role um, will Russia play in either a participant or a facilitator? Um, and what pressure did Bibi put on Russia during his recent visit, uh, during which for sure it was discussed the, um, the Israeli retaliations for the rocket fire 
and where that would go. So I think you'll see an escalation, um, but I think you'll see Iran having it both ways, both being the victim and the aggressor, which um, will allow it to continue its activities further afield in Yemen, Somalia, um, and in other places. Mm -hmm. Jim, you've had the, the honor and the challenge of being ambassador to two of the seven countries that border Iran. Um, can you give us your sense of how you think the Iranians are going to respond? Um, uh, and again, whether you see significantly more aggressive behavior in Syria, in uh, Iraq, in Lebanon, in, mm -hmm. in Yemen. Yep. Uh, I think I would divide the Iranians into two groups. The, uh, Rouhani Zarif faction, with a fair amount of popular support, they are reacting exactly as Mary Beth said. They're going to try to drive a wedge. They're going to try to stay in the agreement because they believe in the agreement. And they either want to make, to misquote Henry Kissinger, Iran more of a state and less of a cause than it currently is, or they want the international community to ignore the fact that it's still very much a cause and focus on the state represented by Rouhani and Zarif in meetings in capitals that look out over the uh, Alps. Uh, the group that I think is more interesting, because they're more powerful and they're more of a problem, are the people around Qasem Soleimani and ultimately the supreme leader. Uh, many of them are going to say, we're not surprised. We've been getting away literally with murder, some close to 500 million, uh, 500,000 uh, Syrians, uh, on a march through the region using what I call the Lebanon, uh, undercut an entire country in order to have both a political and importantly a military uh, fifth column that will allow you power projection. We're applying this now in Syria and Yemen today, tomorrow in Iraq, who knows next. And these guys, and we're keeping the option open, take a look at the warehouse that unfortunately that Zionist conspiracy discovered the other day, we're keeping open the option of a nuclear weapon uh, uh, in some 7 to uh, 13 years. Uh, what's wrong with this? Suddenly the Americans have woken up and they're pushing back. We think they're going to push back. They seem to be pushing back in a stupid, counterproductive, uh, irritate the allies more than uh, focus on us way because they still aren't really committed to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with us in the region. But we're not surprised by this, and we're going to push back uh, and show them that uh, uh, we're not going to slow down anything we're doing in the region. I think that's how they're going to react. Sure. Denise, one of the microcosms where the... the uh, uh, the dialectic between the United States and Iran plays out is, is obviously in Iraq. Can you, uh, acknowledging that the results are, are, are by no means final, uh, but can you give us some sense of what the Iraqi election, at least the results we have so far, uh, may tell us about popular sentiment in Iraq? And, and sure. can you give us a sense of how you see Iran uh, behaving? Sure. Um, again, we don't know the uh, exact results, but certainly the Sadrists, in terms of vote numbers, have, have come out on top. And the Fatah Alliance, which is comprised of the militias, many of them are led by uh, the Iranian-backed militias, also have uh, a significant role. Um, so one of the things I would see is that the trend has been, on the one hand, that there is this Iraqi nationalist movement, okay, that, that, that the fact that the Sadrists have been able to gain the seats that they have is, um, is a reaction to getting out the old, the old system. Um, that the boycott itself also said something, that, there was, it, that, that it, it did have an effect, that there was such a significantly low number of people that turned out in the first place. Um, what I, how I see this playing out for Iran is that the Iranians will, uh, particularly uh, the IRGC folks will continue to take advantage of Iraqi weakness. This is Iran's benefit. It's to their advantage to utilize these small groups that it can. Fatah Alliance worries me. I, I was in Iraq a few weeks ago, and I came back to thinking if, you know, and many are concerned, what's the role that these militias will now play in the government? What ministries will Iran try to influence through its folks on the ground? In the, in, in the coalition formation process. Um, and again, you have to be careful because this is not about just the Sunni, Shia, and the Kurds. This is where I, uh, I think going about pushing back Iran and how they're going to take advantage of it. They're subtle. Of course, Iran's going to have influence in Iraq. They're a neighbor. But in this post-ISIS environment, 
where the government's still weak, the Iranians are going to go with their militia, filling potholes, providing services, doing all the things the Iraqi government can do. And by the way, Fatah Alliance has garnered support from Sunni Arabs in key locations. So these people are joining them for money and services. This is where I think that the Iran will continue to take advantage uh, of Iraq um, during, not only during the government formation process, but afterwards, as long as the Iraqi state remains weak. Um, Jim, I'd like to go to you with the next question and then ask you, Blaze, to, to chime in. Um, implicit in all of the recommendations in the, or all the three strategies in the report is uh, a significant level of American investment. Um, and that is in the context of a, of a current president who has, for example, talked about his desire to get out of Syria. Um, so I have two questions. One, do you think the current administration has given signs of a genuine willingness to up the American ante in the region, or even to keep it where it is? And then secondly, given all the uh, American military involvements over the last, you know, uh, 17 years, how much do you think the American populace is willing to continue to support? I'm glad to take that on. Uh, <laughs> first of all, to get to the administration, no, <laughs> like in so many other areas, they have not given any kind of clear-cut explanation of where they're going or how they're going to get their resources. But I would challenge the whole thing. Every time, and we looked at this in great detail in the mm -hmm. study, uh, the shadow of, at one point, 150,000 troops in Iraq and 100,000 troops in Afghanistan is long and dark over every attempt to do anything in the Middle East. This is wrong. A, it's a wrong way to think because I don't think anybody is contemplating anything like that. And I'll give you an example of the most successful military, one of the two most successful military players in the Middle East in the last uh, five years is Vladimir Putin with his crappy 30 to 50 airplanes and a couple of thousand uh, troops, visors and MP units of uncertain quality. Uh, it's how you use it and who you're allied with and what your goals are, what your diplomacy is, that is the multiplier factor, not how many troops on the ground. But I'll also point out, today we have 15,000 troops in Afghanistan on a cause that I really have to question. And if we go down my path on uh, these three options uh, on Iran, uh, which is uh, rollback, I would take a really hard look at that. Uh, but at the same time as we were upping that, we had, until very recently, uh, some almost 20,000 American troops involved in the fight in ISIS. Mm -hmm. So you add those two things up and you get, at one point in the early um, Trump administration, when there were crossover points before we started pulling back from uh, uh, the ISIS fight, uh, close to uh, 30,000 troops engaged in very close to combat in the Middle East. Did anybody complain? Did anybody point that out? The impact on our defense budget of $700 billion, a few tens of uh, billions, that is, uh, in the single digits, in the low single digits. Now, that creates, if you talk to anybody in defense, this creates all kinds of operational problems on very special uh, elements that are tied down in these areas, and I understand that. But all in all, I think the kind of uh, uh, commitment we're looking for is sustainable uh, if it is linked to key American interests, which we were pains to do in this report. Please, what's, what's your take? Is, is the American uh, population willing to live with uh, 10 or 15 or 20,000 troops in, in the Middle East uh, ad infinitum? Well, I'm not sure that the recommendation is ad infinitum, but I also think it goes back to, uh, to what Ambassador Jeffrey just said, which is uh, about having a clear and articulated objective. Right, and if the troops are, are, are there, sort of uh, either we're, we're not actually admitting how many troops we have or the objective is murky, the mission isn't clear, then it becomes much harder to sustain. Uh, but if it's laid out in, in, a, in a clear way that this is not just a continuation of an unending war, um, but I think the way I'd lay it out is it's not been a, you know, an, a perpetual 17 years of involvement. It's actually been cyclical. Right? And the problem here is that the Middle East is, you know, I'm not the first one to make this actually, but like the godfather, you know, every time we try to leave, they pull us back in. Um, the, the problems keep cascading and we keep having to go back in because of the rights of ISIS or this possibility now of you know, broader Iranian conflict with Israel. 
Um, and it's more a, a question of once we take our, 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 our eye off the ball, once we try to disengage, if we haven't laid the groundwork for sustainable stability as, as our strategy argues for, uh, then negative externalities and bad consequences follow, which keep drawing us back in. Um, and so if, you know, articulating both uh, our interests in the region and objective that tries to get at a sustainable stability that winds down our presence, that, that aims to put the region on footing, that doesn't require constant intervention, um, and discusses the, the alternatives, right, which is complete pullout now, which could lead to you know, renewed engagement and, and greater interventions down the road. Uh, would hopefully, I think, lay the groundwork for political and popular support for uh, targeted and specific interventions now. Please. Can I jump on that for just a second? And I think it circles around to the question of how you think the Iranians are going to act next. Mm -hmm. I think it's what we're not talking about a bit is we're at a point of a little bit of maximum confusion. Because on the one mm -hmm. hand, we've withdrawn from the JCPOA. Um, on, the, on the other hand, we talk about sustained uh, interests in the region while we have a president who, at least the last time that, that I heard him articulate, was very much interested in reducing our presence in Syria on the one hand. On the other hand, you have um, the Secretary of Defense articulating that, um, well, we have a very narrow focus. It's uh, anti-ISIS that may migrate to a counterterrorism, but hasn't yet. Um, so from a, from a you, know, you talked a little bit earlier on about the enemy having a vote. Mm -hmm. From an Iranian perspective, the mixed signals are at least, if not confusing, encouraging to continue probing to see which point of our rhetoric are we really serious about. Mm -hmm. um, and what will the Defense Department versus the White House versus the American people versus the coalition really mm -hmm. allow to be our policy and our parameters of action? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's very unclear, which I believe invites all kinds of uh, activity on the part of allies, but, but more importantly, threats mm -hmm. to try to figure it out and to probe us, um, which will also have the effect of adjusting our positions as we decide what we're going to do. What, what's your bet on where the, this administration will come out, given your comment about maximal confusion and the difficulty of interpreting the current administration's policy? I would not venture a guess. I fear, mm -hmm. I fear um, that we... Um, where we will come out will be murky for quite some time and we'll end up with the worst of all scenarios, which is we take too long internally and externally to make up our minds and articulate them, um, and then even too much longer still to actually act upon them mm -hmm. uh, while the Iranians and the Europeans and the forces that are um, at play continue to complicate the situation. And at the end of the day, um, we'll be a year from now having made very little progress with a situation that has only become more calcified and balkanized um, with alliances even less steady because of serious concerns about what uh, mandates we're willing to actually enforce and act upon, as well as uh, alliances becoming murkier uh, as people hedge their bets, mm -hmm. frankly. Denise, can you give us your, your take on that? Yeah, I, I, I'd add a different perspective, which is um, let, let's take Iraq and what we're indirect ways to balance or push back Iran or roll back Iran. And that is, and it's been very positive, which is reinforcing Iraq's relationship with Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Jordan, Turkey, these types of states to state relationships that have weakened over the years as sectarianism has. Uh, you know, strengthened. So that, and, and Iraqis, many Iraqis have said this to me on my last trip, the more we welcome this, that the more that the United States brings together Iraq with these traditional relationships, the more it is able to balance or push back Iran and, and manage its populations on the ground. So that is something that I think that the United States has done in a very p positive way. Um, secondly, I, wouldn't, I would be careful about thinking that um, yes, we can push back Iran in some of these avenues, but there are many things that the Iranians share with our, our allies. Iran, Turkey, Jordan, so nobody wants to see, for example, they all support the territorial integrity of these states. So Turkey and Iran will work together in Syria, right? And so, 
yes, we can, our, our involvement will be pushing back Iran, but there's just certain parts of it that I don't see at this time uh, that we're going to be able to fully uh, push back. Jim, can you give us your sense? I mean, you're an advocate of the rollback position, the most aggressive one. Um, do you think that's a position this administration would actually take? Well, uh, first of all, this administration, although we didn't put a lot of uh, attention to that in the report, this administration has already taken a rollback position on the JCPOA, on the nuclear account. Now, whether they will roll back to something like what we uh, see with them doing with North Korea now, which is perhaps uh, achievable, uh, or it's, as Bolton uh, said uh, on the talk shows the other day, uh, a uh, Libya solution where they give up everything uh, and do exactly what would they say. We'll see. But uh, my rollback option basically focuses on rollback in two places, Syria and Yemen. Uh, the containment theory, this is a classic foreign service officer trying to split the difference. Uh, Eric <laughs> cited his experiences too. Uh, containment in Iraq, basically for exactly the reasons that Denise said, and uh, modus uh, vivendi in Lebanon because as a guy who at one point was one of the people trying to roll them back there, we have basically lost Lebanon, but it ain't the end of the day. The reason I focus on rollback in Syria and Yemen gets to the point I made earlier. There is something unique about Iran in those two countries plus Lebanon. Nobody else is using this model. I know that Iran has uh, real pressure and friends in the largely Shia population of uh, Bahrain, and we have to live with that. That's classic Middle Eastern. Or that uh, it gets uh, uh, a pass often and uh, has pretty good relations with Oman and Qatar, to some degree Turkey and Kuwait. Uh, that's also part of the Middle East great game, and we're used to playing that game, and if we can kind of balance it, because it's not in our interest that they do better, but we know how to do this. This creating states within states that then undercut the uh, monopoly of uh, violence that states have and then use that as a platform to threaten other states, that's unique. Other than a few de detachments to deal with counterterror, which state in the region is deploying forces outside of its own borders? Israel and Turkey and Syria to try to counter essentially what the Iranians are doing and Saudi Arabia and the Emiratis and Yemen for the same thing. So we're getting a totally different situation here. This has to stop. If we don't do this, those countries are going to in their own even more disorganized and incoherent uh, manner than this administration uh, is doing it, try to stop the Iranians and that's going to drag us all into not the war or the conflict or the uh, confrontation we want, but the confrontation we're going to have to deal with and it's going to be worse. Yeah. Denise, please. Yeah, I wanted to add to what Jim said and, and I agree. Um, first, I think that Iran is undermining our strategic interest and is creating uh, a significant amount of problems in some of these states, particularly Iraq and Syria. But, but I don't think Iraq is that different, Jim, in the sense that um, Iran has every interest in keeping Iraq weak, mm -hmm. every interest in, in, in enhancing sectarianism, and, uh, and every interest in pushing back what would be in our interest is to promote the civic state, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would just, I would, it's the way, I agree with some, much of the rollback, but the assumptions and, and the way to go about it, I would, let's say, add to. And it's based on the assumption that to do this, you need to enhance a KRG, uh, a Sunni, a, a Shia, and you, saw, you start seeing these old ethno-sectarian blocks that are just, I mean, they're there in one way, but it's exactly what the Iraqis are pushing against. It's exactly what the Iraqi election showed what, what they don't want. And that's exactly what the Iranians want. Mm -hmm. so, so if you want to enhance Iranian interests in Iraq, then go ahead and support these old sectarian blocs, KRG, and start using words like Sunni and Shia, which Iraqis themselves don't want. So if you want to really roll back Iran, then you enhance state sovereignty. You, you push this civic Iraqi nationalist trend. That's exactly what the Iranians don't want. But I wouldn't start taking sides and start, um, I just think that you would then therefore enhance the very sectarianism that is allowing the Iranians to benefit. And, and one difference though, where it would probably be easier in Iraq is because you do have this strong Iraqi nationalist um, movement and, and a government that we can work with. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that in Syria, so there's far more opportunities for Iran um, to, to engage in, in, in this uh, nefarious behavior, mm -hmm. if you will. 
One of, one of the things that the report talks about, Blaze, is the, is the importance of diplomacy in any of the, these strategies. It's not just the, the untrammeled use of uh, force. Um, can you give us your take, and Jim, I'd, I'd be interested in your take also on your, your former building, of which I was an inhabitant for 13 years. Um, you know, um, how much has the Tillerson era at state uh, eroded state's capacity to engage in the kind of diplomacy that you're going to need, or at least your strategies would suggest you need to uh, deploy? Well, let me start perhaps at a slightly different point, which is um, the diplomatic potential that I think exists uh, for carrying out some of these strategies, particularly in Syria, where I think you've seen uh, a lot of uh, building uh, European and, uh, and, and Middle Eastern uh, Sunni Arab concerns about what is happening there and desire to partner with the United States and have a comprehensive strategy to, to reach uh, at the very least a political solution, I think at this point, talking about. Uh, ousting Assad is, is, is largely off the table. And so I think there's actually uh, a lot of interest uh, to find a, find a path forward that the United States can sort of work with and pull on and, and, and hopefully lead that charge if they are interested in doing. Uh, I think the, the interesting thing is uh, that that doesn't actually go cut across the region or all the issues that the U.S. might have with, with, with Iran. So for example, I think the European interest uh, or position on the civil war in Yemen is actually very different. Right? I think there they're much more concerned about uh, Saudi Arabian, uh, Saudi Arabia's targeting uh, inability to maybe just hit military targets, civilian casualties, the humanitarian uh, issues involved there. And so they're actually, I think, much more concerned about ending that war on terms that might be more favorable to, to the Houthis. Um, and so how you, how you build a coalition around all of those issues, I think, is, is the issue. Uh, and it will require U.S. capacity and, um, and a U.S., again, an articulation of, of a regional vision that brings all of that together into some sort of both comprehensive objective and vision. Um, you know, I think Secretary Tillerson was trying to do this. If you go back to January, he had an, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times where he actually said, we're not going to be dealing with Iran solely through the prism of JCPOA. We're, we're, we're taking on a comprehensive strategy that tries to get to uh, Iran's destabilizing behavior in the region, and that'll be our primary objective. Um, he wasn't around long enough to, to put that into effect uh, and maybe didn't have the support to do that. Uh, I think from everything we know about Secretary Pompeo, he has a similar set of concerns um, and, and perhaps will be similarly motivated to, to try to address that. Uh, whether he has the backing of the White House, whether he has the backing of, uh, of, of, of the Pentagon to do that remains to be seen. Um, but I think the, the ability to do that for the United States, the interest, at least, for uh, working from partners to do that is there. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, of seizing it. Jim, what's your, what's your take um, on that? Okay, on diplomacy in terms of uh, how to carry out essentially any of these uh, uh, courses of action, uh, everybody in the region, including the key powers, uh, Israel, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia wants one or another version of what we're selling with this thing. The problem is they not only don't all want the same thing at the same time, they also will compete with each other. We see this with the uh, Turks, PYD, uh, Saudis, Qataris, uh, and the underlying problems with Israel and the Arab states beyond what people are willing to do behind uh, closed doors. Those are all huge challenges for American diplomacy, but at least you've got people who kind of signed up. Europe, and we're really seeing this in stock uh, colors right now, Europe is a huge problem. Europe has defined international security, not just Europe's role in international security, which I can kind of understand in pity, but <laughs> international security as a whole as the JCPOA, things like the JCPOA and the Minsk process with the Ukraine. Now, both of them I actually more or less support. But that's only part of the portfolio of uh, tools you have to deal with security threats. And thus, when something like the Syrian conflict, which has produced this whole wave of ISIS terrorist attacks in Europe, not really in the United States, and an immigration outflow that has almost destabilized the whole continent, they don't know how to react to it. And it's even worse when they see us doing anything that goes against this philosophy 
including military action, are, quote, tearing up agreements or, you know, even minor things like lethal weapons to the Ukraine, they get very, very unhappy because we are challenging not just an agreement or a situation, we're challenging their worldview. Mm -hmm. So Europe is a huge diplomatic problem, and it's going to be the biggest problem we're going to have in the JCPOA, I predict. Not Iran, not China, not Russia, not India. Mm -hmm. uh, next, uh, as far as the State Department, look, uh, the last year and a half has been really difficult for the Department of State for many uh, ways. Uh, given Mike Pompeo's experience in uh, the CIA, which was very positive from the standpoint of the people there and using the tools of bu the bureaucracy in his initial uh, uh, actions and the response to them in the State Department, uh, he'll turn this around quickly. Institutions are very resilient. Yeah. The State Department, I mean, I, I know... Uh, uh, Eric and I, I mean, you know, when we were like FS2s, we figured we could be undersecretaries. <laughs> and that's, and believe me, there are hundreds out there who are even more sure of themselves than we were, okay? And uh, some of them actually with good reason, so they'll do fine. Hmm. So it's time to go to the audience for uh, questions. Uh, a couple of things, please um, I wait for the mics. There are a couple of people with mics. Second, Please identify yourself. And third, if you can, please uh, let us know who you're asking the question uh, to. So, sir, in the blue shirt. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Bill Cruzy. Um, I've enjoyed these, uh, this uh, presentation, but I have a question. How can we have a modus vivendi with Iran when it's stated foreign policy is to, to destroy one of our allies in the Middle East. I don't know, anybody? Yeah, very good. I, I could not agree with you more. Um, it is one of the options in the paper, and I think it depends on how you look at it. I think many of us would agree that a modus vivendi um, someday, maybe, if possible, but so many things about Iran fundamentally would have to change, I think, in order for it to even have the baseline for a peaceful or mutually responsible place in the region. Um, you know, the time for looking, I think, at the possibility of a modus vivendi, at least in the shorter medium term, would have been to look at Iran's behavior post JCPOA, where I think, not arguably, it got pretty much what it wanted. It got to deal with the United States, it got a serious commitment from a serious president. It got um, a significant amount of relief across the board, economic as well as, as in other aspects. Um, and rather than change its behavior, uh, it doubled down in ways that outside of the agreement, some would argue within, but we'll put that aside, outside the agreement, uh, Iran demonstrated itself to be everything but a responsible interlocutor um, and a responsible player that you could coexist with. Um, when, when one intrudes upon the sovereign territory of another repeatedly, using proxy forces and then with the IRGC, um, I think at that point you sort of remove that as a hopeful, maybe someday we could work toward category, but certainly nothing for the immediate future. Anyone else? Please. Hi, Rachel Oswald again with Congressional Quarterly. My question for the panel at large is, is if you had the opportunity to advise um, senior um, congressional leaders, um, what would you tell them? There's been a lot of discussion here about how the Trump administration hasn't really demonstrated a plan B. What role is, con what role is, what is the role of Congress in perhaps legislating some type of plan B? I'll jump in and say one of the, the recommendations we have in, in the report, specifically for the rollback option, but it could cr cut across all of them, um, is an AUMF uh, to deal specifically with countering ir Iranian aggression. Right now we're operating uh, in the Middle East under uh, the 2003 authorization of mil use of military force um, having to do with fighting al-Qaeda. We're fighting ISIS, which didn't exist at the time, uh, and, and we've had... Uh, General Votel, who's uh, the commander of CENTCOM, say that countering Iran is not part of his military mission in Syria, um, and, and partly that could be ascribed to not having the authorities to do that other than responding to direct ag aggression uh, by Iranian-backed forces, as we've done on several occasions. 
Um, and so uh, Congress, at least taking up debating, potentially passing an AUMF that, uh, that targets Iran and its proxies or authorizes U.S. force against Iran and its proxies, uh, would send a strong signal, whether it's used or not, uh, of at least the U.S. willingness to, to take a more uh, aggressive position against Iran. Uh, it could either be the basis of a rollback option where that AUMF is actually used, uh, or it could be part of a containment uh, and modus vivendi option where it sort of signals red lines and the U.S. Uh, willingness to back them up credibly if, if Iran uh, tries to violate them. So that would be one option for, for, for congressional action. Please, can you see Congress enacting such an AUMF and taking that level of responsibility? I think there is uh, a desire in Congress to have a debate about uh, all the ways that the United States is using military force uh, in the Middle East and, and more broadly and whether they're, they're actually covered uh, by, by the, the AUMF that we currently have. Uh, I think that that should be welcomed and, and pursued. Um, whether there, there's actual appetite to go uh, to expand the scope of U.S. military activities that are covered by congressional approval rather than, than restrict them, uh, I think is an open question. But, but, but right now, certainly ahead of a midterm election, uh, I, I do not see that sure. uh, being politically viable. Sure, sure. Right. Oversight is extremely important because this administration, even more than most, uh, has a tendency to mix uh, exploratory wish upon a star policy ideas with actual uh, troops to task, fragos to the military and to the diplomatic establishment to get things done. And it's very hard to sort that out. We cited a moment ago uh, Joe Votel uh, telling Congress that he only has authorization to go after uh, uh, ISIS. That was after twice uh, Liz Cheney in the House and uh, uh, Lindsey Graham in the Senate took Rex Tillerson's January uh, very broad Syria policy, which we cited repeatedly, but didn't seem to have a whole lot of roots in the bureaucracy and an execution, and say, uh, where do you fit as the military commander in the region to this exposition of U.S. policy in the region? And bang, we got what was a pretty dramatic thing, which has snowballed into the president's blowing up on the uh, idea of uh, 200 million and other things. Uh, this, these guys need a lot of sitting down and challenging what they're saying versus what they're doing. That's a really important job of U the U.S. Congress. Can I just Please. add one thing? I don't, I, I'm so skeptical with Congress's ability to, to act, and you know, we have an administration that's really putting together its foreign policy team now in, in profound ways. I think I would step back and, and, and ask Congress and our leadership writ large to think hard about whether you want to have leverage in the Middle East and what kind of leverage you're going to need to advance U.S. interests. And what I think is something that is pretty much indisputable, and that is in order to have leverage in the Middle East, you have to have skin in the game. And skin in the game means a consistent, meaningful presence. We can debate about how many numbers that are, where they're located, and what their roles are. But you have to have a presence. It has to be a continuity. And you have to have fairly clear lines about what that presence is there to do. Um, and we can, we can debate about language as far as uh, statutory uh, powers. We can talk about ROIs or ROEs. But at the end of the day, someone's got to be sitting in the Middle East conducting US military as well as foreign policy. And that also means getting ambassadors out to the field yesterday. Sir, over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Samuel Hickey. And so I know uh, Denise Natali mentioned speaking, uh, just working more on empowering the state, less focus on the sectarian side. And I do have some questions about the modus vivendi and how sectarian that basis is. But I was wondering, in working on this project, uh, did you guys really consider the building up of regional institutions and ways to really empower the states on their own and really just bring them into a place to discuss and work on these issues? I mean, with Iran basically, you know, working on smaller, uh, smaller pockets within each state and kind of weakening them, how we're able to really work to embrace the region more and, and how much institutions really played into what you guys were considering? I don't think we were very optimistic about multilateral institutions. Um, uh, we had a we had some discussion about 
the various European and multilateral discussions going on with, within among the, uh, Russia, Turkey, Iran, et cetera, as perhaps not advancing uh, peace in any way. I think one of the places where we all agreed, I think we lamented a bit that the GCC um, hasn't been able to uh, unite itself in order to come together with a particularly aggressive uh, shared stance in some respects. But I, th I, I don't want to speak for the group, but I don't think we really talked about. But can I just Please. make a comment? We, we didn't, but I, I would like to add to that. that there's unlikely to have you know, regional blocks where you're having this cohesive policy as, as regional entities. But what, what is gradually working, or let's say is bilateral relationships in, and these states coming together so that Turkey and the Iraqi government are, you, you can see this, a, a, a re, reconverging, right, as opposed to working directly or only with sub-state actors. That Jordan um, and the Gulf states are reestablishing relationships with the Iraqi state. So some of this is happening on, uh, in reaction to and some of it also is happening uh, with the nudging and support of the United States. Listen, I think we've come to the uh, end of our time, so let me thank uh, everyone in the audience for coming, all the panelists for speaking, Ambassador Edelman and Jake, and uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center for, uh, for providing a venue for this discussion. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.